Harper County. That's my girlfriend. But someday I want to move out there. <laughs> All right, well, we'll get going. Uh, a little bit smaller group than what I was hoping, but thank you all for coming. Just to introduce myself, I'm Craig Dinkle, crop production agent for the district, uh, which covers Russell and Ellsworth County. Uh, just to kind of get going uh, on the Russell plot, I know like I said thankful for the rain we've received. It you know, definitely came just a little bit late, maybe for this wheat crop, but hopefully. Hopefully we'll still be able to cut a, you know, somewhat average or, you know, some places maybe might get a little bit above average. Uh, just to go over, you know, where this plot's located, if anybody wants to look at it, it's located right east of the Russell High School football field, kind of right off State Street. I uh, got the signs up and it's marked, uh, Jeff Arkansas helped me uh, go walk in the past, so. Uh, Feel free to definitely go take a look at it. Uh, definitely interesting to see what how some of these varieties handle the moisture stress and heat stress that we've had this this spring. And just to uh, kind of go over the variety that's planted on the pool field that's outside of the plot is LCS Chrome, uh, planned on October twenty second of twenty twenty one. Uh, had a 100 pounds an acre of urea applied pre-plant, and then another 130 pounds an acre of urea applied post there in February, and then sprayed with uh, finesse and MCP uh, for weeds. Uh, no fungicide has been applied, and disease has just been pretty, pretty minimal on that field. Just a little, since it was continuous uh, crop, just a little bit of tan spot. But even that was very, very minimal this year. So moisture was our biggest factor this year in, in our wheat crop. Let's see, I think that kind of covers it. And so here today we got uh, Romeo Lolato, uh, K State Research and Extension uh, wheat specialist, and Kelsey Anderson Onofre. Uh, Kish State Research and Extension Wheat Plant Pathologist. So I think that kind of covers everything and we can start getting into the varieties and discussions. On the, there's like 22 or roughly varieties there. So Awesome. Yeah, that sounds good. Thanks, Craig. Uh, morning, folks. Good to be here with uh, you today. I guess we haven't had a plot in Russell County for a number of years now, so I appreciate Craig putting it together and, and you guys showing up. Maybe we can build a tradition out of these and then start building the, the group back again. Um, yeah, so maybe before we jump into varieties there real quick, uh, just a little review of what we're seeing around the state, right? And, and we're traveling quite a bit and going out and about. So what are we, I mean, what has the, the wheat crop faced through, through this season? And I guess we're having some discussion early on and uh, you made some really good good comments there in terms of uh, how the wheat loop is, is looking, right? And really, uh, you know, this part of the state, I guess you guys have been still in that kind of blessed part where where the wheat's looking actually fairly good. As you start moving west and west from here, kind of like that higher, Highway 36 and, and west, once you go past that Smith County uh, and west, it starts to get bad in a hurry. Actually, around Norton, we were getting fields and fields that were like, 14 inches tall, 12 inches tall, and, and going through rain. So rough, uh, really rough there. Uh, of course, depends a lot on the cropping system. It seems like uh, whenever the guys are double cropping wheat after beans or as you go west after corn as well, conditions are worse. Uh, in a, a second crop wheat or a wheat after fallow, it seems like conditions are a little bit better, maybe just some more water in the soil at planting there really made, making a pretty nice difference there. Of course, the worst region in the state is Southwest Kansas. Um, you know, uh, we'll never go from uh, that Kern County, that region, things are, are rough. Every single field are, are in that, uh, that height that I just mentioned now. There's a little bit of effect still on the cropping system there. So now we're talking about maybe a less than 10 bushel breaker potential in a continuous situation versus maybe a 30 bushel potential in, in some place after five. So, Really tough situation out there. Uh, and one surprise to me was that uh, I was thinking 
it was more focusing in that far southwest corner of the state, west of Erdogan City. Uh, but really, uh, I guess you made a comment early on that Brad, things are looking really rough. And, and, and that's spot on. I mean, I was surprised to see how far east those conditions are, are holding. And again, those guys may have had a little bit more moisture here and there, but they have much sandier soils. And so the conditions are just to the crop itself are just as the out there. Um, you know, in terms of general uh, crop development uh, in, in the season here, uh, back in the fall, we had enough moisture for a good emergence kind of throughout the state. And so we didn't really have issues with uh, late emergence or, or anything like that for the most part. Uh, in fact, out in Western Kansas, those guys plant very, very early. Uh, they end up planting around that September 15th because that's when they had moisture. And that crop grew quite a bit. I mean, it was, it was a big crop going into the winter there. And that big crop uses a lot of water, right? Just that biomass, it's gonna require more water. So uh, we had kind of a bigger crop going into the winter and then that uses more water. And then we had such a dry, cold winter uh, that really didn't help the situation there. That cold winter, uh, there was a long winter as well, kind of helped crop development back. So at one point in time, we're estimating that we may have been three to four weeks behind where we should be in terms of the normal crop development uh, that we come to expect every year. Uh, but then May came around, those 90 plus temperatures uh, on a daily basis there for a couple of weeks, and the crop really tried to catch up and, and speed up there, uh, the development during that very important phase when we're determining the kernel number, right? So that period when the crop is going through pollination and we're determining how many grains we're going to have in an area, which is our biggest driver on yield there, uh, the crop was actually going through it fairly quick. So in that took a hit in our yield potential as well. And from that, we're seeing quite a bit of freeze damage here and there, uh, kind of throughout the state. Uh, so very consistently, I think it's worse as we get south, probably of that Hutchinson region. Uh, but uh, even up, up here, we're seeing some freeze damage as well. Just uh, different symptoms in the field, perhaps uh, just the top of the head may have been uh, kind of toasted with that freeze or the bottom, so just kind of not very uniform there. But another cause of white heads this year has been heat stress. So the heat stress that, that the crop went through early on in May there, uh, really slaughtering off some of those uh, late producing tillers as well. So many times you get a plant and maybe the, the I mean, the two or three tillers that were produced later, they're kind of like completely white all the way to the bottom. That's kind of how we identify heat stress out there. So um, yeah, not, not a very pretty situation there for the wheat crop this year. Of course, this rain still is gonna help the crop uh, in, in parts where we're still going through those early phases of rain feeling up here. Um, a little bit later as we go northwest, so, so it should still help. South Central, we were there yesterday. Actually, we finished up around 9 p.m. yesterday in Caldwell, uh, like near the Oklahoma border there. And so the crop down there was uh, some of the early varieties there, well into the, the, the soft dough stage of development. So there's not enough help. And the crop has started to turn color fairly consistently around there. So probably it's not going to help much out there. But up here, I think we still have a, a nice effect from this rain here. Folks, a little bit of uh, what we're seeing around the state there. I didn't touch anything on diseases because we have Kelsey here. So maybe Kelsey, you want to give a brief overview of what we're seeing around the state this year? Yeah, sure. So it'll be pretty quick. Uh, you know, Craig is awesome because he's like one of our best disease scouting agents. So he's always out looking for uh, strike rust and, and diseases. And that's really helpful uh, for us. So thanks, Craig. Unfortunately, we didn't find much strike rust this year. Well, you know, I should walk that back. It's too early. Fortunately, we didn't find any strike rust this year. I need to talk as a as a not plant pathologist for a minute. Yes, it's so, all about perspective. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, I apologize. Usually I can, I can make that switch better. So fortunately, we did not have strike rust this year in Kansas, which is really good, right? For the last five years or so, we've had some pretty bad strike rust years uh, in parts of the state. So why didn't we have strike rust this year? A couple things probably led to that. So we actually start thinking about and tracking strike rust uh, development based on weather in Texas in the fall. So actually, that's where our strike rust and our leaf rust kind of lives and survives for the winter. And if we have really good conditions in the fall there, that kind of determines how many spores are going to make their way up to us in Kansas each year. 
right? So this past fall, we had some things working for us, right? It was dry and it was, it was a little too warm. So we think that kind of cloud of spores or that kind of spore potential we had coming into the spring was low. Then what happened, right? Romulo summarized this pretty nicely. Then it was dry and cold, right? So for stripe rust, kind of the best stripe rust weather is when it's cool. Well, kind of like right now, when it's cool and you've got um, really nice rainfall and your canopy staying wet for multiple days, that's really that, that prime stripe rust time, uh, uh, weather. It's good wheat weather too, right? So that's kind of the trade off there. Uh, but we, we definitely did not have that coming into April. So normally we detect stripe rust in Kansas, especially when it's going to be a bad year, around April 10th, April 15th in that southern uh, part of the state. And, and we just didn't detect it this year. Um, so it was dry, right? So that, that really uh, led, us, led us to believe it would not take hold, right? We started to feel pretty confident we wouldn't have bad stripe rust. Oklahoma had very, very low stripe rust levels uh, through the spring. And then what happened, right? In May, temperatures really shot up. So it, we did get some moisture, but the stripe rust actually will shut down when nighttime temperatures get just about above 75 degrees. Uh, so our nighttime temperatures went above 75 degrees and our daytime temperatures were above 90 degrees, right? So that really arrested stripe rust development, even in the plots that we have in Kansas where we're trying to we inoculate them and we give them irrigation and just that temperature just arrests everything. So that was good for us. So uh, no strike rust this year, very, very low levels of leaf rust, another rust disease that prefers warmer weather weather. So we usually see that on the tail end of the season here in Kansas. Uh, so overall, a very low rust year. Another fungal disease that we've had uh, just sporadically in parts of the state is scab. Right, so that's one we, we heard about a little bit more in Western Kansas last year. So scab is uh, uh, it has a sister disease, right? It's called Fusarium head blight or scab has a sister disease in, in corn called Gibberell ear rot. So it, it's really bad in those acres that we have after corn, and we do have some more acres as we move west after corn. And really, the perfect scab weather. Uh, well, if it was a little warmer, it, it would be right now, right? It's when we have a lot of moisture right around flower. So that is that time when the crop is really susceptible and those spores kind of come up from that corn residue and can hit those, those flowering parts, those anthers that can cause infection. So uh, we're expecting we might see a little bit pop up uh, in, in some parts of the state this year. We saw some uh, this uh, actually yesterday in some of central and south central Kansas, but we don't expect it to be a, a very bad year because a little bit colder than, than uh, it would need to be for, for a really bad scab to take off. You know, the big story disease-wise this year uh, that we're hearing a lot about is wheat streak mosaic. So uh, out here in West, right, we're not strangers to wheat streak mosaic virus, but actually we're, we've gotten a lot of reports and done a lot of field visits in Central Kansas and South Central Kansas this year. Uh, for wheat streak mosaic. So that's been uh, one that, that has been uh, a big issue. So we'll talk about some varieties uh, that might have some, be a potential tool there. But as a reminder, that's vectored by a tiny curl mite, right? So that curl mite survives in volunteer wheat or other grassy species and can move into our wheat crop uh, after planting in the fall. Those fall infections are much worse than spring infections, for example, uh, and we're seeing that. So, has anyone else seen anything or heard anything that either Romulo or I haven't touched on here uh, while we're going through this background? Anything? I have just a couple questions, oh, yeah. Kelsey, if, if that's okay. Um, first of all, with respect to Wheat Street Mosaic, I'm curious, uh, was there anything different about this fall, like for example, uh, Central Kansas, maybe more acres of wheat planted uh, because of the market conditions or whatever, and maybe planted early and, and, and slow to, to freeze. But were the is it some what was the cause of more wheat street music? I'm just curious. Well, so I was just we were just talking with Daryl about this um, earlier too, and you know I think yes to those. You know, interestingly, what we're hearing in some of these cases is more um, double crop soybean and rye. So those, those crops aren't coming off the table. There's wheat planted nearby much earlier. So you have some long-term fighting in those 
and so forth. So in, in a few of our, our field visits, that's been right? But I don't know if we totally put our finger on, you know, why there's been such a bad outbreak in that region this year. Uh, Daryl was giving some perspective that it feels like it's, it's maybe moving, uh, it's been moving east. So that kind of is probably has been building more over time. But yeah, I mean, we're still kind of scratching our heads about, about why and this year and last year with things like that. Actually, we were, if we look at our trends of, you know, our data on, we do look at the virus testing, so we'll, I think you have these super great, send it to the plant that he's diagnosed at the clinic, you can tell you if it's these or coronavirus virus or something else. Um, so if we look at our trends, usually you have a bad year. Last year we had a bad year in Central Kansas, and then usually you get a dip, and then you get a bad year, right? So usually then, you know, there's an effort to manage, and then you know, then that goes away, and then we get, get kind of these peaks and valleys. So, so we were actually, we were really expecting because of that, that this would be a low year. So it's been a bit surprising. I, think. I know uh, cover crops can also, you know, brine, tracheal can be vectors for, you know, another host. Is, do you think there's increased cover crops in those areas? Yeah, that's a good question. I guess we talked about this before as well. You know, if you have a summer blend of cover crops there that has some uh, some hosts inside, that for sure could could, could help. Uh, and we see an increase in use of summer crops in the in the central part of the state, perhaps not as much as we go west. But it's probably that combination, right? I mean, every kind of every single grower they were talking yesterday, they were in a, almost in a continuous cropping situation or in south central Kansas, right? Cutting their wheat off, going back to a double crop soybeans and very or a double crop milo, uh, and then so I think that that combination, right? Perhaps more cover crop usage and, and with species that are hosting that mix, but also I think in terms of acreage, I'll see a lot more of that uh, just double crop summer crop after a week, and you don't get to control the whole deer very well uh, inside that canopy. So I know the producer of that sent a sample in from Eastern Ellsworth County. You know, he pretty well knew where it came from because his neighbor, you know, not too far away, they'll crop some wires in the piece of wood. <laughs> yeah, it's not, not very easy to find, to find where it came from many times. Uh, we were in a, it was, it was a part of the town, I think, that uh, this field of SY Monument to the left was, to, to the east was just toasted. I mean, especially the outside of it. And then it got better as you go into the field. And right here you have uh, Stubble, double crop milo, a lot of volunteer. So, yeah, it was very, very, I mean, very easy to detect where it came from. <coughs> the other question I had was back to striped rust. I, I appreciate your explanation and that we didn't have the environmental conditions. Besides environmental conditions and variety selection, is there anything about the local environment that has? impact on striped rust? I mean, so for example, is, is no-till more susceptible or than conventional or, you know, residue or anything, or is it pretty much all about the general environment conditions for striped rust? Yeah, so I think those, you know, if they have influence, it would be much, much smaller because a lot of our inoculum are smaller, they're coming in over the top, right? So it's, Unlike some of our fungal diseases that survive in the basic areas, that kind of splash the these areas, splash their way up. And most of our inoculum is coming from the top. So the, the biggest drivers, well, the, the biggest is environment. Stripe rust is surprisingly picky. <laughs> it's actually really hard to get good infection. We struggle with it. Um, it's it's very picky in, in like greenhouse and earth too. We, we struggle to get it um, infected. So it's amazing it happens so bad <laughs> every year, right? Throughout these very regions. Uh, but but for me, the driver is that leather and the, the amount of uh, spores that are, are coming. So you know how many spores are coming in from the Angola, how many spores are coming in from Texas. Those are kind of the, the key drivers. And then the, the key one, one of the big, big things is is that variety that we've got. So you know, that's always the first question I ask when somebody is that. You know, Paul's in anticipation. If there's going to be, you know, a need for a fungicide, well, the you know the first thing is what variety do you have, right? Because some.
some of these just will, will lead back to uh, good resistance. And the other one is, well, there's no story for us near the moment. So that I think that's um, a long answer to your question, but that residue, you know, it's for spray press very specifically is not the biggest factor. Yes, I have a question about spray press also. Do you think now that we're having this wet weather and everything, do you think the stripe for us is going to come here? Like, is it too late that we're a filling? Should I be spraying fungicide on? Or since I'm almost full, just let it be and just hope for the best? I kind of, that's my question. I've asked a couple of different people the same thing. I'm curious on your take, I guess. Oh, shoot. Well, you can compare me to them. Right? Yeah, well, <laughs> well try, try to figure out what I should do because I, like last year, it was supposed to be wet. I saw the weather. I sprayed everything mine. And this year, it's just pretty dry and stuff, trying to keep it. But now the weather's really kind of changing. And I'm really worried that rust is going to come in and, and stuff's not completely full yet. And I guess that's that's what I'm asking is, do you think, do you think if we're pretty much filled, do you think it's worth putting that fungicide on? Or just... so after, after Kelsey responds, I want to hear, hear what the other two said. As well. Okay. So, All right. Yeah. <laughs> well, this is good because sometimes, well, actually, this happened more than once this year. Somebody will call me and they say, I just got off the phone with Eric. That's my predecessor. And I'm going to ask you the same question. Oh, <laughs> yeah. I know. So, so that's okay. But usually we're, we're pretty we're pretty close there. So, well, my first question is, you know, I've got a couple of points. What, what variety do you have? Um, well, so I do a blend. I do six variety blend is what I do. So it's kind of, I can name them most of them, but I couldn't tell you except for a couple from my phone. But I did like Greenfield. I did Bob Dole this year. I did Tam 114. I did, I don't know, there's some other ones. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think we did Greenfield was one of them. And then there's two other ones that are numbers, but I can't, I can't remember what, what numbers I had this year. But I do a six, I do a six way blend just for this exact reason. But last year it just seemed like I just, the fields were just, all of them had rust pretty much, and I sprayed, and there was a big difference. You know, 10, some of them, there's one field that I did that data I got off of was almost a 15 bushel difference for the stuff I didn't do, for the stuff I did do, and I had all those different varieties, and that's kind of why I do that. But I'm just kind of curious on your take, just, do you think it's too late, I guess, is what I'm getting at? Because I, like you said, this, like, perfect conditions is kind of what I'm worried about. So I, I think at this point, there's very low chance we can have any yield limiting strike for us in this part. If you think about it, actually, even if we, you know, there was infection today, mm -hmm. so we, I don't think we have enough spores coming, you know, because we haven't had strike for us, it's shut down in the moment of Kansas. So the inoculum is not there, right? But then even if we got strike for us today, we wouldn't see symptoms if the weather stayed really nice for the disease, we wouldn't see symptoms because it takes a long time in that plant to incubate for 10, probably 14 days or that, right? And then it would take a little while for that to, to pick up um, uh, and, and yield up. So the chance, by then you're kind of well into your brain health here. I think the crop should be, should be getting close to shutting down uh, there. So I don't think it's a problem. Uh, this year, you know, I keep saying to people, if you spray this year, that's a that was a good decision. And then they say, but I didn't spray this year. And I say that's a good decision, right? Oh, okay. because of the, <laughs> <laughs> so I have to give you that because the price, you know, the price of rain was so good uh, this year. You know, even if we got that protective spray on, that's good. If you didn't, that's good because we didn't have we didn't have spray for us, right? We didn't need that insurance. <laughs> I'll say the caveat is uh, most of those fungicides has a 30-day pre-harvest interval, mm -hmm. or, you know, they, they say you can't spray after feeds 10.5.4, which is that end, actually the end of the flowering period, so mm -hmm. it's pre -green. So most fungicides at, at this point, based on what you're saying, um, are kind of very close to or into that gray area of the pre-harvest interval, so I always want to say that. But I think, you know, 
I would I would put money on it. <laughs> you can come back and you can uh, you can you can bug me later if I'm wrong. But I really strongly feel we won't have a, a bad strike rust outbreak in this area at this point in the season. Most of those plants. So there's a lot of answers to your question. Most of those varieties we mentioned, they also uh, when they get a little older and the temperature goes up a little higher, they kick on some um, extra defense. So most of our varieties have some late season defenses that actually kick on. So it's pretty rare to see that late season strike for us. Okay. Well, your answer was the same as other people. So you did get it. Yeah, I asked about a week ago about the same thing that at Sims, and that's the spray thing. Blaine guy, he said, just wait, see what happens. That thing. He said that it's too late. Like you said, flowering was when you should have done maybe before flowering is kind of kind of your window there. So I was just making sure. <laughs> right, you want us to all vote. Help you yeah, I think so. <laughs> I vote to save the money and pay you for life. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think you're, you're pretty safe this year, for sure. One, th one thing I noticed this year with our drought and heat that we had is that it just the wheat just rocketed into reproductive quick and movement from flowering to you know, kernel development, just like that. And everything I've seen last week was half to full berry development already. Yeah, definitely that, that heat strength we had in early May really kicked in the reproductive development. And I agree, we were, in our own program, we had some protocols there. Okay, well, we could spray at 50% heading and then we're going to spray at uh, very early yield. We got some different products and PGI products that we're looking in terms of uh, yield gain there. Man, it was hard to keep those needles. Yeah, because oh, they all came together so quick. Yeah. We had some mid flowering, early flowering treatments, but they were, it was like, what, do we spray this in the morning? <laughs> I mean, it was that, it was, it was that fast. Mm -hmm. it was but it's interesting comment that you're using a plant there, a six way. I don't think I've come across that that many many times you see three way or four way, right? Yeah. But uh, yeah, in terms of the disease tolerance on that, you kind of keep keep in mind that it all depends on how many susceptible varieties you have there and how many resistance. And on on average, you know, we kind of see a pretty uh, steady trend that it's going to be an average of all all those uh, packages that you have there. Let's say that you have three resistant and three. Uh, susceptible, right? Usually going to be more or less in that intermediate side, but I think it's going to be a slower development of the disease there as well, just because you have fewer plants that are susceptible in that mix, right? And so whenever that spores come, they come in, you know, they're going to keep more resistant plants. And so that's one line of defense there. And the other one is just slower development as well, because as one is developing susceptible, maybe it hits a resistant one later on and, and it slows down there. So, so uh, it's a, it's a good strategy. It usually, if you compare the plant with, uh, with the individual counterparts, you might have uh, a small 3%, 4% good advantage in most years there. Uh, again, because of that type of disease uh, problems. Not every year, but most years, you might see a little bit there. Well, and uh, we had a problem with mosaic last year, and I had a field with my six varieties on it compared to a field next door that just had one sole variety. The mosaic completely wiped out the other field. And my field only made, you know, I think it was like 18 or something. But it's kind of kind of neat to see that these two fields got affected real bad, and the one that was just pure one variety got completely wiped out. And then the one next to it, you know, you can tell some of the plants were really bad, and some of the plants were kind of okay. It was just kind of kind of well, it was a bad deal, but it was that way. It was kind of cool to see that our variety idea is kind of working that way. <laughs> I don't mean to put you on the spot, but was your blend a design certified blend, or is no, it a blend I, that you? I think your, yeah. Like, so yeah, so I I go through and we we kind of have a plot type thing. We'll do so many acres of this variety that we pick out. We do three from the last year, and then we pick three new ones. So we're kind of kind of tossing and turning, and so like that's why I was interested to come here just to see. But some of these varieties, like I've never planted a couple of these, so I'm just kind of curious and trying to get new information on them and stuff. And so we're always planting six six varieties every year. So I'm getting new seed wheat every year. You know, it's like no old stuff. You know, it's not sitting in the bin for two years or whatever. We're always planting six varieties every year to just mix together.
Sometimes we do five for each solution for six. Like I said, we'll do three new ones that I didn't plant yet, and then three old ones still from last year. Just kind of How do you blend your wheat? We'll just go through and uh, we cut some, and then you're going to go around and go to the next right, cut it, just kind of toss and turn back and forth. So have one, 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 cut one, yeah. And then we put it in the grain bin, and then we'll put it in the truck. And then you put it in the, you know, the actual <laughs> grain bin itself. And by the time you get all that, it'll it'll be mixed up. <laughs> and then by the time you clean it, it's yeah, treat it, it'll be as you would. So. Yeah, that's an interesting approach there, uh, harvesting them differently. Because I mean, that's usually, you know, uh, one struggle there is how do we mix everything up? You know, up to two varieties, I think it's pretty straightforward. Up to three, some guys are going to start complaining. Six uh -huh. can be kind of a nightmare there. So, yeah. Yep. Yeah, I know what you're doing. <laughs> Very good. Uh, any any folks? Any other questions, discussions, or points before we jump into varieties? Very well. LCS Chrome. So I guess as we're going through the varieties, uh, a couple of different things here. So we're going to be discussing a little bit of the agronomics and disease facts of these varieties, but also what I, I'm bringing here is a, like a summary of yield performance for for varieties in this region. So uh, we're looking at about five locations here. It goes from Salina, Ellsworth, uh, Belleville, all the way to Mitchell County. So in this kind of north central, central and north central Kansas, right? So we, we avoid looking at a single location only. And so we try to get data from all, all around you guys here. That should be a little bit more representative there. Uh, and then one year of data, two years of data, and three years of data, right? So now we're going to, so just whenever we're talking about new data, keep in mind that we're looking at a little bit broader geography there than only here in Russell. Um, but it's all around you guys here and looking at one, two or three years of, of data in a row here back to 2019. Very good. LCS Chrome, it's been around for a while, right? Probably don't need a lot of introduction for you guys. Uh, a few things that I've liked about Chrome in terms of agronomics here, standability, it's been pretty solid there in terms of straw strength. Acid soil tolerance really good in Chrome as well. Um, Drought tolerance, it's pretty decent as well. It, it extends out west and its footprint fairly well. Uh, one concern that I usually have with Chrome here, you know, maturity, it, it is a little bit on the late side. It's probably on the latest one that we have around here. So in that blend situation that you want to, you don't want to have something that you need to be waiting on to harvest, you know, Chrome may be, unless you have a late blend, uh, Chrome may not, I don't know how much, how I was going to feed. You uh, put or you performance in Chrome here, folks, it's been ripping that average of the pack. So last year, only average of five trials, it's been slightly below average there. Uh, and if you look two years or three years back, it's right there at average. What does that mean? It means that it's still competitive with most of the varieties that we are evaluating in this region here, perhaps just not showing up in the very top end view, uh, probably because we have some newer varieties with a higher potential. Yeah, the, the watch out on Chrome is that Strike rust on this variety has been slipping over the last uh, few years. So we've had some new races introduced into the region. Uh, so probe used to hold up really well, but it's been downgraded a little bit for strike rust. Probably responds better to that, that strike rust fungicide, um, holding up well for wheat rust. We were visiting with the Viva Brain Breeder um, last week. And if you like the chrome, they got a lot of chrome derivatives coming kind of down their pipeline. So there'll be some some new uh, leaf of grain varieties that are kind of derived from chrome in the future. LCS Revere is a slightly newer variety there, but although it's it's been around, I believe, since 2019 or something along those lines. But for some reason, they didn't have the Revere in our youth plots for, for a number of years there. We actually just have one year of data in the uh, from case state trials where we're looking at LCS Revere. Um, this variety, they, they, they were putting it kind of like a T158 replacement. So it's gonna ha have kind of like an earlier maturity there. It's like a medium early uh, material. Um, should have a pretty decent drought tolerance coming from that T158 background. Supposed to have higher P low soil pH tolerance than T158 had as well. So moving a little bit better into the central part of the state here. Um, yield wise, the one year of data that we have on Revere, it's on that top third here for this region. You know, it, it, it was fairly well. It was averaging 81 as compared to 77 off the overall variety average. So 
just one year of data there on Revere, so keep that in mind uh, in terms of new data, but it was doing fairly well. Uh, drought and heat, whenever we think about the T158 background, uh, if you saw it back in 2018, that we had a very rough year in terms of drought and heat. I mean, T158, it was looking for probably the worst thing in the block, but the yield was there, right? It's just because it kind of catches in those resources early on. So you look at it and it's looking just like it's it's almost uh, dying there from the drought and heat, but that what it's doing is just like catching those resources to the grain. So it's just a strategy that it, that it uses on, on drought and heat there. Um, uh, according to Lima Grain and Revere, we could expect something similar there. Not much in terms of meal and baking quality, if that's a, if you're trying to get paid for that. And it is a certified seed only variety as well, I meaning you need to, to buy seed every year. Yeah, so that's one thing you'd have to watch on your lens. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. why you got to clean out every year and you have to buy it in yeah. every single year, which kind of sucks. But yeah. Oh, and, and then you don't know how, what's your mix when you're harvesting that mix as well, right? You don't know what you have there in terms of proportion, mm -hmm. depending on how, what. So you don't know if it's a six each anymore. Or so. So we're we are like 258, it's been holding up really well for strike rust. So 258 uh, has a really good strike rust reaction here in Kansas. It's one of the ones that has been holding on very well. Uh, the watch out is uh, susceptibility to wheat rust, right? So in those years when we have some warm, wet end of season conditions, we might have um, a wheat rust issue with, with Regina. So this is one. So we're going to talk about wheat streak mosaic virus. And we'll talk about kind of a few different types of resistance that we can have in varieties, right? So we've got actual resistance to the curl mite, just to have some background, right? And that is in several of our varieties. Uh, then we'll talk about an actual resistance gene for the virus itself, called WSM2, Nutrient Mosaic 2. There's a resistance gene for this. Then we have kind of a bucket of varieties that are just a lot less bad than some of our other varieties, right? So in when they're put in those bad meat street situations with a beer volunteer, they seem to still yield some, although you will see symptoms, um, and we don't know where that resistance is coming from. So Revere is one that we expect to perform in that less bad than some category, right? So it probably still will yield, uh, but you will see symptoms, it will get dinged, but maybe you'll have, you know, that 20 bushel of Maker versus versus nothing kind of situation. So that's that's just one one comment there on what we're talking about when we're talking about wheat streak uh, resistance types here. Coming up next, we've got LCS Valiant. Uh, so Valiant is another one that, was, that, that we were able to see for a while now. Uh, the background of this variety is actually coming from UNL, from from Nebraska there. Uh, now, probably maturity was a little bit too early for Nebraska conditions, so they licensed it out to Lima Grain, that they had a little bit market footprint there. And it has actually done really well in, in central Kansas. When you look at the EU data uh, throughout the central corridor, all the way to uh, south central, but in particular here in north central Kansas, it's been kind of towards that top third. Uh, just last year here, it was yielding very similar to what we had in Revere uh, that, that I just talked about on the top third. We look at the two year averages consistently on that top third again. Perhaps not highest yield in the plot there, but very, fairly consistent in that top third. If you look at three year average, it kind of goes a little bit more towards it's still above the average, but still maybe I'm not on that top third anymore. So, has had a decent performance in this region. It's got a really good standability. So, that's a trade on, on Valiant here. Uh, seems to have a decent drought tolerance, tolerance as well. It doesn't handle soil pH very well, so low soil pH may be a concern. If you guys have any acid soils that, that are reaching to those low fives or something along these lines, probably there are better varieties out there. Really good meal baking protein and, and, and coming from that Nebraska background, good winter hardness as well on, on Valiant. Now, Kelsey, this is one that we might need to buy on a fungicide, right? Yeah, so nothing, nothing to write home about on the disease package on LCS Valiant, so very susceptible to wheat streak mosaic and also susceptible to leaf and strike rust, right? So this is one that would, would definitely, um, you know, be a candidate for that, that flag leaf or, or heading fungicide application in a bag here. LCS Runner. So this is actually the first year that we are taking a closer look at the uh, LCS Runner, at least within case state trials. So we don't have any new data to share with you here. 
Uh, little bit that we know from it is actually shared from what Lima Grain was putting out, right? A little bit on the earlier side of maturity there. Some of the similar traits that we had in me in terms of drought and, and, and acid soils there. Uh, but I think also they're mentioning maybe a, a mean with an improved head block. Although, again, we haven't seen it as much, so don't, don't really have any yield record to share with you uh, on LCS runner here. Do you have any more info on the disease factor coming? Oh, no, that's exactly right. So we really like to see these varieties in our own state state. Uh, screening, especially for diseases, uh, but they are saying, uh, again, maybe a bit, slightly better head blight and also uh, uh, some other nice disease package traits, right? They, they have a, a picture of a runner and they are saying it's a good disease package, so we'll have to wait and uh, and check out some of our data, hopefully this coming year. We'll have a little bit Up next here, we'll have uh, LCS Julep. So julep is another fairly new uh, variety there. We actually have one year of new data on, uh, on julep. It's a, they're putting it out kind of as an LCS mint replacement, but with a better standability, right? So that's kind of their, their main thing on julep here. Uh, so in terms of acid soil, should handle acid soils fair, fairly well, drought stress as well. So they're kind of putting julep as a similar uh, area of adaptation than what we had in LCS mint, but with that better standability. Maturity is going to be similar to mint again. And so mint, it could be a fairly late maturity, kind of that uh, medium late side at least. Uh, so expect that from this one as well uh, as you're planning. Uh, for you guys up here, that late maturity might not hurt you as often as guys in South Central Kansas. But at the same time, you probably don't want to have all of your acres to a late maturing variety, right? Kind of, you want to scalinate that uh, harvest uh, later on. And you also want to hedge your bets there in terms of uh, if you have an early maturing variety might be more exposed to freeze damage, but it might escape uh, heat stress later on, and vice versa. Right in a late maturity like this, you might be more uh, uh, you might be able to escape freeze damage more often, but then you might get caught on the heat later on. So just balancing that out a little bit. Um, what about the disease package on on Julep here, Kelsey? Yeah, so I think when this was um, originally going to be released, they hoped it would be mint with better strike for us. But it seems like now it's a bit more susceptible than, than I think they can hope uh, to our races here in, in Kansas. So it would mean that potentially a fungicide in those bad uh, strike frost years. You know, just an observation in some situations with bad wheat streak mosaic that we've been seeing, Julep seems to be holding up uh, pretty well. Doesn't again doesn't have any of those major genes that we think about uh, for wheat streak mosaic, but it's going to be less bad than some of the other varieties we've talked about. Here. Did you mention it? This is a CSO only. Yeah, it is a certified seed only. That's a good comment as well. Uh, you know, whenever there are some certified seed only, we kind of come to expect at least something like a, either a herbicide tolerance trait or like a really good scab tolerance or something along these lines. Um, I don't see necessarily anything here that pulls me into buying seed here every year, especially when we look at the performance. It has been kind of towards, we just have one year of data from K State trials, it was going kind of towards that bottom third. Uh, but there was some previous data from the regional trials that the breeding uh, nurseries have that it, it was not it was not shining too much in those trials either. So let's take a look at, at another year of data before I me on this one. That's where I would be right now. LCS Atomic AX, so uh, coaxial technology here, right, guys? So that AX in the in the end, it tells you uh, that variety has what we call exogen traits. So that exogen trait, it gives it herbicide tolerance, right? For the herbicide aggressor in this case. Uh, now, very important not to confound that uh, aggressor with the clear field technology, right? There are two different technologies that if you mix them up, you're gonna have a really good control of the wheat crop itself. And unfortunately, <laughs> you're gonna toast it. And unfortunately, we have had that happen a number of times already. No, so every now and then we got a call last year, this year again, of just some mix up, uh, whether it was not a really good record keeping in terms of what was planted where, but uh, the wrong herbicide was sprayed and completely terminated the crop. So coaxial technology, aggressor herbicide. It's gonna be a really good tool in your toolbox to go after ferro rye, perhaps some, uh, some brome as well. Um, and it's only for grassy weeds. The clear field technology, it's probably going to be a little bit better on your joint and both grass there. Uh, and it's going to bring some broad leaf control as well. So just kind of different tools in the toolbox. 
the coaxium is a little bit more picky in terms of when you spray it, uh, in terms of uh, you need some, uh, some growing conditions for those weeds. So if you need the spraying, it needs to be followed by about five days of temperatures above 40 degrees. So there's active growing uh, of those weeds so that herbicide can actually uh, work better in those conditions. It's very picky in terms of gallons per acre as well. You need to have a really good coverage uh, in order to, to go after those weeds. Uh, and there's some uh, stewardship things that you should not use more than two years out of four, or you cannot use more than two years out of four in the same field. Uh, so it's up to you if you do it back to back, or if you do one year, skip one, another one, skip one with that tec technology in a field, uh, but you cannot go more than two years out of four just to avoid building herbicide resistance. There are a number of quacks varieties out there now. Uh, LCS Atomic is one of them out of Lima grain, and actually uh, it's, a, it's an early maturing variety, so it kind of allows for a little bit earlier harvest there if you're going for double crop beans or something. Uh, Yield-wise has been pretty solid. Atomic in our yield data, out of the Quaxin varieties, it's been one that has been performing very well, both in central Kansas and in western Kansas. So uh, just in terms of yield performance, is one that is very competitive even with varieties that, that are not Quaxin, just haven't shown you the doors of so one to keep an eye on if you're, if you're needing that technology um, out of those quacks and varieties, probably one of a little bit better standability as well. We were in a trial in Hutchinson, or I was there yesterday, uh, that um, we were seeing some different levels of lodging. Some of the other varieties, they were, they were lodging fairly bad, and the was still hanging in pretty well under those conditions. Uh, so good standability there on, on, uh, on Atomic, early maturing variety, very good yield record as well. Keeping in mind, we only have one year of data of it. Right, so last year it did really well uh, across the state. Um, mill and bake, milling and baking properties are going to be, be kind of on that below average there. And it's not necessarily a very high tillering variety, right? So uh, kind of keep your this variety at that optimum planting date, probably optimum to, you know, you don't want to go too late to be just because it's not a really good tillering variety there. It will produce a good amount, but it needs to be, uh, it needs to have some conditions for that. What about this disease package on Atomic here, Kelsey? Yeah, so Atomic, we don't, again, we have maybe one year of data, but it seems to be holding up well for strike rust. So this is one that, uh, you know, might not need that strike rust herbicide application uh, or which would have much lower infection than some other varieties we're talking about here, but it's on the more susceptible side for meat rust, right? So that's, that's kind of a, a trade-off there. You know, we're still getting some data on Wheat Street Mosaic, but it seems to just be uh, moderate and susceptible, right? So it, it's not going to be anything special, although not the most susceptible uh, variety that we'll talk about here. Um, yes, a quick question. You just talked about if this would be one you want to get the optimum planning date, right? What do you think the optimum planning date is? In our yes, <laughs> that, that's, that's a good question. No, that. yeah, that's a good question. So uh, I actually had a student that I, that I asked him to try and come up with those dates for us, right? So here's what we did. Uh, he looked back in 20 years of variety trial data uh, for Kansas, uh, Oklahoma, and Colorado, right? So a little bit bigger geography there. And what I asked him to do is subdivide it into regions that are more similar in planet, right? So that's the first thing he did. And so we may have uh, North Central Kansas as a similar region in weather, then Northwest Kansas, Southwest, and into Colorado. So we, we end up with about uh, eight or nine different regions that are similar in weather across the entire geography. Then what I asked him to do is to just plot, uh, you know, he had over 100,000 yield observations for those 20 years. It's just a lot of data. So I asked him to plot all those yields, uh, planting date versus yield, right? And usually, usually what we have is just a blob of a bunch of points there, right? So you don't have a whole lot of relation. But what you can learn is from the top, what, how, does, how is your yield potential affected by by your different planting dates. You usually have a curve like this on that top, right? Where you, if you go too early, you're losing some yield potential there because maybe you have more viral diseases or it grows too much and use much water, right? And if you're going too late, you just don't have enough time for dealing. So that's kind of how we went about trying to define those for the different regions. For, I think that for this part here, North Central Kansas, we're looking at about that uh, October 8th to 13th, more or less, being at that peak. You know, if you just want to make sure that, you, that you're getting that yield potential. As we go west, it goes, uh, it goes earlier in, in a hurry, right? If you're in northwest Kansas, Kobe, and into northeast Colorado, that same peak is going to be about September 25th, 
right? So it's much earlier there because of the altitude. Uh, so that's kind of kind of how it is. So if you compare those peaks, it's going to be earlier out there, uh, and it's as late as about late October in, in in south southern Oklahoma, right? So the trends are kind of clear in terms of where it is, but it's hard to give one date only. It's about their range of I think that that it was around October eighth to the thirteenth, more or less. How does that sound to you guys? I mean, I always love the feedback. You know, sometimes you're gonna say, "Yeah, if I wait that late, I might not have moisture." Right? So there's some real life scenarios that each consider. So, well, that's it. It's that's very interesting, and I think what you just, the study approach you just you described is really great. I mean, that's helpful. Um, I grew up in Brooks County, and, 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 and as a boy, we always used to try to plan around September 25th, mm -hmm. and then I couldn't believe it as I. I grown up, move away, come back to this area, and I can't believe we're planting wheat so late here. And like, I think this wheat plot that, that out here on the FFA farm was in, was it in October? Yeah, the 20, 22nd. Last, last, second. last year, but last year was an outlier. Yeah. So I, I like <laughs> that, you know, first October to the 15th, like, I've always liked that time frame for plant nothing. Uh, I agree with strong though. So we're always a little, I think we're a little, maybe based on what you say, it's awfully easy to get a little quick on the plant. And, uh, and, uh, and so that's interesting. Uh, yeah. The Hessian fly doesn't seem, I mean, we always used to go by the Hessian fly. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what the Hessian fly state is here. Mm -hmm. uh, September 15th, 18th, something like that. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think it's 18th or something like that. So that's probably after that date you can kind of get started, right? Uh, and you know it's going to depend on the year a lot, right? Some years the earlier plant is going to do better than the, than the late plant. That's why we have that blob of points that's just like you have, I don't know, five thousand points there. That's it's hard to 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 figure. That's why I say, okay, well let's look at the at the youthful things, right? As far as we can get in that region, where's the where's the off? And so that, that, that'll be the range. But then there's a lot of things that you need to consider in the farm, right? If it is September 28th or, you know, October 2nd there, and you have good moisture, I wouldn't wait until October 10th should be on the off one, perhaps, right? And this, this year, a lot of people were scared to plant early because the army worms were so bad. I don't know yeah, around here, yeah. but like towards the array, they were so bad, we were worried about planting early. We kind of waited until October 1st to the 5th, and we kind of waited a little bit to plant because they were just so bad. Yeah, so a lot of things like like that, and I was hearing about that as well. I think down at MacPherson, they were having some issues there too. And so uh, there's a lot of other things to consider, right? But if we can just say, okay, well, if I if I would have that off, right, where is it? And so uh, that's that's around what we're finding kind of for this region. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Is it over disease on the tummy? I think so, right? Yeah. Yeah. It is. All right. <laughs> So LCS Helix AX, the next one, a coaxial variety. Uh, based on what Lima grain is pulling this out of, they think it may have a, a higher yield potential than what we have in Atomic there. Uh, if we look at the yield performance of Helix in the in this part here of the state, North Central Kansas, last year, one year of data that we, that we had, it's again towards the top third. So it did, uh, it did really well last year in this part of the state. Maturity is going to be slightly later than what we had in Atomic. So this is going to be kind of that uh, medium early side of uh, of maturity here in in, uh, in helix ax it was one yesterday that it was uh, it was showing some lodge there so I'm, I'm not sure if we how much in terms of standability we have out of this one this yesterday i mean it's just one point one observation but the majority of the trial was standing fairly well and a few varieties were down um, fairly bad and, and helix was one of those so I'll be a little bit, I, I want to see the a few more times before taking any decision there, mostly because of that potential for, for lodging. Um, good on acid soils. Um, in terms of grazing, this is one that you don't want to graze because it does have kind of more of a, that slower start. And I think that uh, Limit Grains kind of put this one for you to manage a little bit better just going after that new potential. But again, with the ability that I saw yesterday, I'm a little bit skeptical of, of recommending that at this point. So disease package wise, I think the key difference with Atomic is going to be that strike rust action. So Helix is a little more susceptible on that intermediate to slightly moderately susceptible um, side for strike rust. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, but more resistant to leaf rust, right? So kind of the inverse of what we talked about there. 
uh, for a deformity. Very similar in terms of their weak street mosaic reaction. Coming up next, we have a WB4269. Uh, so very briefly here, I was reviewing this yield record. Uh, whenever we are taking a look at the West Red namings, right, the first number here is going to tell you the weak class. So hard red in the wheat. All varieties in Kansas should start with a four, unless you're doing some trials there with spring wheat, right? That should start with a nine, I believe. Second number gives you maturity. So one through nine, one being an early and nine being a late. So this one is, a, is an early maturing variety. Third number will give you the year of release, right? In this case, it could be 2016. Last number, really uh, no, no information there, just an identifier, just an identifier. So there will be 4269, a uh, variety that uh, is geared more towards central and eastern Kansas. It's an early maturing variety, excellent standability on this one. So it, it has a very good straw strength. The yield on 4269, it really comes out of a lot of, a lot of small heads. So it's a very high tethering. Potential in this variety here just puts out a lot of tiny heads. That's where the, the, the yield comes from on this one. Um, we have seen it in whenever it's in, in fairly, I mean, not extreme dry conditions, but in intermediate drought conditions, it seems like a, it's one of the earliest ones to roll up the leaves. So it's real, it, it looks, um, it doesn't look really good in those conditions, right? Because you see that plant, it's all like a, almost like a pineapple plant like that. Um, but it seems to yield fairly well in those conditions as well. So that's kind of like a water saving strategy that's kind of rolling up the leaves and trying to lose less water there, perhaps saving water for, for later on. So in our trials, it has done fairly well. You know, if you look at the two year average for 4269 in the central and north central Kansas here, it's been uh, on that top yielding group as well, uh, above average there. I tend to like it a little bit more as we go south, mostly because of maturity. I think this early maturity uh, may, may be a little bit better in south central Kansas there, but you, you record in, in central and north central has been fairly good as well. It's, uh, it's been on that top third. Last year's mark it was more towards the average, but 2019 and 2020, it was actually uh, very consistently in that top third up there. Is it kind of a shorter variety or is it taller? What about that? I can kind of tell in the picture, I don't know, that's kind of shorter to me, I guess. Yeah. yeah. It's going to be a medium short. It's, it's not going to be a tall variety by any means, but it's not the shortest out here either. You can get some high tweet. I think next one we have 4699, that, that will be a shorter week than this one here. So it's, it's, it's a medium short. So it's going to be depending on if you have grain field in the blend, you might have to go through a lot of straw in the combine to get, to get both heads there. Yeah. Uh, so Kelsey, maybe this one is a good tool for those acres that are corn. Right, so we're going to talk about three West spread varieties here. Um, all of them have pretty good scab resistance, right? So they're not quite as good as kind of our gold standard in this region, which is Everest, right? And then probably set the uh, two products out of the casing breeding program. Uh, but it's really nice to have a traditional tools, right? Before that was probably all we had in this region. And now, you know, we can make some other decisions based on, on agriculture. So other, other disease uh, factors for 4269, it's holding up well for leaf rust and stripe rust, right? So we rated a four out of nine. That means um, that means it's a, a good reaction, good for barley yellow dwarf. Um, I, I would say it's it's pretty good. So there's a, a bit of a difference here. So it's good for some of our leaf spotting diseases, but not for others, right? So that might be a watch out, some of those hand spots, Aturia. Um, residue borne diseases might be an issue uh, in this variety, but overall a very solid disease package, and particularly if you're going in those acres after corn where you might have scab risk. Of course, so to, back to the uh, fish and fly, you can't get away from reading here about global warming and stuff. Is that that's going to all of some of these things aren't they going to affect? Yeah, I would expect so. I would expect so. So once we see, uh, you know, global warming, talk to some people, it seems like a, maybe the weather is going to start moving up north a little bit, right? So we may start looking more. Of, uh, we may start looking more similar to what maybe Oklahoma is now, right? As a state, Kansas. So the warm would, would start moving up. So that would alter often planting days. It would alter uh, the days when this pest would be more prevalent as well. So there would be a lot of interactions there. 
Uh, I don't think it's going to be a switch from day to night, but slowly, maybe we are already seeing some of those. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Maybe the, the, all the malls that are out right now, what's the right area? I have not okay. caught one to see what it is. We got <laughs> Yeah, no, that's a nice comment, and we, we think about that quite a bit as well, and how things are going to change, and how our recommendations might have to change in the future as well, based on that. So. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you. Yeah. Folks, 4401 is the newest one out of the West Red lineup that we have in the block there, uh, 2020 release. Uh, so we just have one year of data on, on 4401, uh, and last year it was really good. It was actually topping the, the, the trial, uh, or topping the five trials in this region out here. So really good yield performance in the first year of data that we had out of 4401. Uh, so let's see how it handles this year, because I think one of the drawbacks of 4401 here may be uh, drought dollars. Uh, it's not based on what West Fred is putting it out. This may be the far west end of where it might work well. Uh, you know, just because you might get into, uh, might get caught into drought stress and it's probably not the best drought tolerance that we have out there. So just keeping that in mind, last year had an excellent year, uh, kind of throughout the central part of the state, the north central and south central as well. Uh, but I don't know how far west it's going to move. Medium early maturity variety, it's going to be slightly taller than what we're talking before here on, on 4269. Um, but it doesn't have the same straw strength. Probably has straw strength to, to hang in there. Uh, for the most part, but it's just not uh, many of these West Red rice, they have just a very steep straw and, and hanging there very well. This one you can look at it and, and you see that just it doesn't look as, as, as strong in terms of straw strength as compared to the other ones. But again, as Kelsey was mentioning, another two was performed there. Yeah, so oh. one of the things, so you know, these three West Red varieties are certified seed only. And you know, when we talk to the West Red Rats, you know, one of the things about 4401 is that it does have some uh, important disease uh, package components, right? So it does have that scab resistance, so it's another option after corn. Uh, uh, and then it also has pretty good, and we're seeing this just in, in one year of data, right? But it's holding up pretty well for our strike rust in the region. It's intermediate for leaf rust, so that might be just a small watch out there. Uh, but, but other than that, it, it seems like it, it has a good package for those kind of two important diseases. Now, that, that, this is one that seems to come out fairly early out of the winter there. So probably I wouldn't plant it too early either. I'll keep it to medium or late time of the uh, planting season there, just to make sure that it's not getting off growing too early in the spring. So. Up next, uh, 4699. Uh, this one has been around since 19. So we have a little bit more yield data on 4699 here. Actually, we can go back three years and, uh, and it's up there. So 4699, the year that it came out and was released at 2019, it was kind of off the charts in terms of yield. It was really kind of like a, a pink buster out there. Um, with that, also a very low quality, right? So quality is going to be a drawback of 4699. The other year, 2020, the second year that it was out, uh, it was yielding very well still, but then no, uh, up there comparable with some other high yielding varieties that we were having. And last year, it was more towards the middle of the pack, actually, if we take a look at, well, actually not here, for this region, it was, again, just last year, towards the top as well. As we go south central Kansas, it was more towards the middle of the pack. So three years in a row there, it has been a pretty good yielding performance uh, in this region. It's going to be a medium late maturing, uh, maturing variety. Uh, it's a short, this one will be a short stature, really good straw strength. Um, one concern with 4699 will be acid soils. Out of the ones that we're talking so far here, it's going to be on the, the, the more susceptible side to acid soil. If your skills are getting to that low uh, fives or so, you know, might, might have better options out there uh, as compared to 4699. But so far, it has been a really good, really, really good yielding variety uh, in the central, north central part of the state uh, here as well. Yeah, so this one, you know, it's going to be on the more susceptible side to wheat streak mosaic. Um, you know, one thing we have a note that we thought it might be a little more intermediate, but some of our newer observations are showing that it, it's pretty susceptible. So that's a watch out there. Uh, but again, it's another option for, for SCAD, right? It's probably on par, maybe just a notch worse than Zenda. And, and we see that in some of our trials as well. Um, 
it's more susceptible to strike rust, right? So this would be uh, one of the West bred, uh, the, the West bred variety to watch in this lineup uh, for that strike rust reaction, although more resistant to leaf rust, right? So we talk about some of these varieties, and it's pretty nice, you know, if they are susceptible to strike rust, but resistant to leaf rust, that, that's kind of a nice thing agronomically because we can make that flag leaf fungicide application protect us early from a strike rust in a bad year, right? And then we have that late season protection if there is leaf rust at the end of the season there, which is kind of a common scenario uh, here in this region. Yeah. You mentioned when it was launched in 19, it was a bit buster top of forms. And then next year it, it yielded well, but but you know, and now it's in the middle of the pack. So often we hear these new varieties come and then they fall back. Is it because the that variety is not doing as well? Or is it because new varieties are coming on that are just that much better, and then and that's why they're sliding down the path? I'm curious. Yeah, that's a really good question. I think that just within the three year period that we're looking at, I don't think it's just because we have newer varieties with better. I don't think that the youth potential of the new ones would be that much better. I think it's just a, a variety by environment type of scenario where, uh, by luck, perhaps. Whenever it came out, was was a perfect environment, right? Yeah. And then uh, next year was probably not as good, and so it kind of it's still up there. But then the, the third year may really have been an environment that was not for that variety. Uh, so it kind of showed us that the youth potential is there, you know, and the performance has been uh, pretty solid up there. So, so uh, yeah, but I think it's more a variety by environment. Now, if we look back, right, if we look like 2016, 2015, 2017, the the rankings will change completely. Now, from that time to now, I think we have higher youth potential in the varieties, right? So back at that time, you'd have a monument towards the top. You'd probably you'd have maybe uh, the sandals probably going to show, show towards the top very consistently at that point in time as well, right? And maybe these varieties are now more in the middle of the pack, meaning they're still very competitive, but maybe we have a little bit higher youth potential in the new materials that are being released six, seven years later here. Uh, Show them. So I think that there's, there's a little bit of both. The short term is more just an environmental thing. The long term we have the, the genetics there for sure. Yeah. My opinion, at least, Daryl, would you think that makes sense? Uh, yeah, I agree with that. As you go through a breeding program, you have this term that's called genetics, right? So every cycle of breeding, right, you get a small percentage of yield increase. So you don't see that shake out, you know, year to year. But we went back to people sometimes say, like, I'm going to go back to planting Jagger. Right. Like, well, I think we have better options, right? Well, maybe maybe in some environments that would be you know an okay idea, but there is this incremental increase in yield potential as you go through. Yeah, and I, I think it's a it's a challenge that growers have to manage from a grower perspective. That and I see this more in row crops where maybe it's a Milo variety or corn variety, and, and, and the grower has really good fortune with it. And, and then you get down the road three, four years, and they're like, well, it's just not doing like it used to. Well, yeah, it's doing like it used to. But now we have better things to compare it to. And is what I think happens. And so I think that's an interesting element of trying to sift through these variety selections each year is, is to try to ferret out. It wasn't, like you said, it wasn't just the luck of the draw that that happened to be a great year for the launch of that product. Mm -hmm. um, or, you know, and, and that's why you do these trials like year after year, right? See over the long haul, but recognize that in the you know, genetics come along. So. Yeah, absolutely. And we have the opposite example too, just in, in Larry, right? The case state variety. As it was released right off the bat, it had a few really bad years because of leaf rust. And so, you know, we, we were very excited with it because of the potential that it had, but it came out and it had a few bad years. Now we look at the last year, a couple of years in a row, Larry's up there. I mean, if you look at two years in a row, North Central, Larry's number one. And so you say, okay, well, the, you know, it was the other way around because of the conditions when it was launched. So that, yeah, there's a genetic game there, but there's also that environmental piece that plays a huge role there. So. Yeah. Let me go to the question, though. We did a study a few years ago, um, and Jagger was an example you can use because it's been used for almost 20 years in the state trials. And and just looking at the performance of Jagger over those 20 years, you would say it's the same variety. It would kind of average out, right? It's the same over time, but it actually increased over time. And so 
you know, you say, well, why would that happen? Why would a variety get better over time when you're just looking, not comparative, but you just look at the objectives? And, and part of it is management, right? So, so we started switching over that period of time to a lot more regional situations, right? From regions, and, and so we managed the variety that we started introducing some fungicide treatment trials, you know, some things like that. Yeah. Um, I think the other thing that's important when you look at these, these trials is to not just look at that. Middle. You really need to understand what the management of that location was, you know, and, and it gets down to things like planning, it, right? So. Um, well, well, the researchers aren't necessarily planting over a big window of time or location like farmers are, right? Because, I mean, one of the things I found out about planting wheat is it kind of takes a low priority, you know, when you're not harvesting the fall crops or doing some of the things and, and you can get in and plant wheat, that's when you plant wheat. So, we plant it early because the ground's ready and you can do that and, and you can't pick corn yet. You know, but now we're going to perform, and so now we're going to come play because, you know, we still got a few open acres and we want to be covered, you know, those kind of things. So, we manage this in a different way in that regard. But, um, that, that first year performance is really important to the variety, but, um, you know, also that planting can, can, can be really important. Some varieties, um, you know, like to be planted late. You know, you know, I'm sure we're probably going to talk about some of those. Um, you know, if, if you want to go in after beans, what a variety that's going to come up really quick, come really well, because it's going to be late, you're going to have to cover the ground quick. You know, but other ones on plant early, they plant all those trials on the same day, same location, right? They just come in, they plant it, you know, and then they go to the road. And so that might not be the optimal planting date for that variety. So, Daryl, am I wrong? Should we go back to planting Jack? <laughs> No. <laughs> no, I mean, there's, you know, I mean, I told this story before. When I started in this business 40 years ago, we were lucky if we got two or three new varieties a year, right? You know, from four or five different breeding programs that were at the time. In the last five years, we've averaged 15 new varieties a year. It's incredible what's coming out of breeding programs. Are they better? Breeders think they are, you know. But again, if it doesn't hit that first year, um, it, it could just go away. And, and I think that's the other thing that shows up in the performance test is a lot of times the ones that don't hit in that first couple of years, they drop off. And it's, it's an expensive program to be in this testing program, right? And so you're not going to spend money on a variety that's not doing well in there. So you start taking those low performing ones off the list, and it makes the top ones kind of move down. You know, um, there's a lot of things to look at in the in the data, whether it's the K-State data, which seems to be across a lot of different varieties, or you're looking at the company data, which seems to focus on theirs and maybe what's new. So, yeah. and I think I think it's doing the farms probably just as important. And, you know, I'm not sure I agree with this. So, <laughs> we should have a conversation about that. <laughs> <laughs> Very well, the big grain field. Well, this one's been around for a number of years now. Probably many of you guys have either planted it or, or have seen it uh, on a neighbor. Uh, you know, we had a really good run. It's an old one that uh, still has a pretty broad area of adaptability there, uh, large footprint. So that comes about from an average, like intermediate uh, S soil tolerance on grain field that allows it to move east fairly well, and a decent drought tolerance that, that allows it to move west fairly well. From this region, I think I, I like rain field from here in west. It has been a really good yielding variety for a number of years there. Uh, medium to medium tall in terms of height, maturity, it's gonna be depending there, medium to medium late. So it tends to be more of a medium late if you go more towards central Kansas. From here, northwest, gonna act more, more as a as a medium, medium maturity variety there. Just overall uh, has been a pretty, pretty stable variety. Now, I guess in the recent years, uh, it fell down in terms of disease ratings as well, right? So you need to be on top of that more and more here. Yeah, so this is one that, you know, we've, we've seen become more susceptible to stripe rust and leaf rust, right? More susceptible doesn't mean the variety changed, but it means that our rates of stripe rust and leaf rust have, have kind of overcome uh, what was in the background there. So. You know, there'd be some watch outs more susceptible to wheat streak mosaic, more susceptible to scab, right? So this is one, you know, we actually use in some of our fungicide trials as, as one of the varieties, right? It does respond well in those 
those high strength breast years to that undecided active patient. KS Dallas. Uh, there, we want to talk about the, some of these K-State varieties here, so we shake up things a little bit. Sure, sure. So uh, K-State Dallas is a variety out of our Western Kansas breeding program, uh, Hayes. Uh, it's been out a few years now. The thing that I think really sets Dallas out um, you know, from some of the others is the wheat streak mosaic resistance, um, in that it's effective at a little higher temperature. Um, so, and Kelsey can tell me about you know, how that works, but um, we're really kind of pushed it to southwest Kansas where wheat streak mosaic is a problem, but it has actually done pretty decent uh, through central Kansas too. Um, it's you know, kind of a medium maturity, medium height uh, variety. When it first came out, it had you know, decent resistance to the spike rust, but I think we kind of lost some of that. Now, we crossed the uh, it was pretty decent on it. Um, it's really uh, done well uh, throughout the, the southwest part of the state, but uh, even up in the northeast Colorado, we had a good one. You want to talk about the temperature sensitivity? Yeah, so I think I mentioned there's that wheat streak mosaic resistance gene, so WSM2, wheat streak mosaic gene. That gene is good, it's resistant, uh, it provides resistance against that wheat streak mosaic virus, but it's temperature sensitive. So in some varieties, that means around 65 degrees, that will turn on, right? So uh, if, if it's potentially very warm in the fall, you might not get the benefit of that resistance or one spring. But Dallas goes up to about 70 degrees. So that could be an extra couple weeks of protection uh, with this kind of higher uh, threshold uh, for resistance to the mosaic. One very small caveat is that that gene does not provide resistance to other viruses that are vectored by that wheat girl thing. So we have a couple other viruses uh, like triticum mosaic virus high plains uh, disease, uh, wheat mosaic virus, that um, are also vectored by that, that, um, that chromite. They might see symptoms in, in Dallas, uh, but they actually might be from a related virus uh, uh, there. So we've gotten some calls about that kind of situation um, where there's actually a high triticum mosaic virus level in this, in this variety of similar. So it's not a perfect tool, but it's a good tool if you do have those high risk uh, wheat streak acres. I, I would certainly go with this over, over some of these varieties. I think we're kind of on the <laughs> eastern edge for Dallas. It doesn't have so long mosaic resistance. And so you know, I know that sometimes can be a problem in this transition zone. Um, so that's what we're going to But I have actually seen it um, at the Republic County very well. Am I talking about Western Star too? Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay. Well, come on up here. <laughs> yeah, come on up. So, uh, Western Star is uh, another one came out about the same time as uh, Dallas. Um, kind of another medium maturity, uh, medium height, although uh, maybe it's a, it gets to be a little more on the later side of maturity wise and a little taller on the height uh, wise than some of the other ones we talk about kind of in that same, that same group. Um, it's done very well in Western Kansas. Uh, Really high quality variety. Uh, it's on the green craft list for, for quality. So uh, it tends to be a little higher in protein. So I don't think it's kind of in this area of the state. There are some things going on here too. Um, it, it's done really well uh, in, in the first couple of years in the Salina test. So we can talk about the test there. So I think you know, we can move it right away uh, east. It does have sort of one mosaic resistance, and, and I see it. Do really well for this part south with all the stuff we just got to move it on the line. Um, and, but we also can move it kind of northwest to probably not southwest. I'm not sure that its drought tolerance is as good as what I'd like for southwest Kansas, but certainly you know, very adequate for, for this area and kind of some of the things we experienced in Kansas. Yeah, well, when we summarize the northwest data for yields, Western Star is doing pretty well up there. Yeah. It's, uh, Sold yeah. 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 So we, we had it in our wheat seed treatment plots out of this last year and it did really good. First year out, we had a producer down in the south of Hayes there and got nipped in the breeze. 
horrible. I mean, I I saw it and said, so it'll have to make you know, to make 20 to 40 in the playoffs. And, and, and I think it made it one more 60 for him. I mean, the recovery of it was just really surprised that it would have to go to bed on that. Um, <laughs> that's yeah, it's, 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 I wouldn't want to force it through the situation over here, but it's, 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 Daryl said it's somewhat plain. <laughs> <laughs> is that what we're going to take I, Yeah, I think it's one that should be on your short list in this area. Yeah. You know, I think there's other ones too. You want to spread out maturities and things like that. Um, Rice beer good? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> one of the, yeah, I mean, one, one of the concerns I would have about it is a really high yield environment it gets to be straw strength. Um, I mean, you're really pushing it far until you might you know, the peak of the standard. But it's always fun to pick up 80 and 90, which will be Richard's standing point. <laughs> right. Look, your, your prices. Yeah. <laughs> Ahern. Uh, so Ahern is a uh, new release from K State University. Uh, and that's really all we would want to handle K State. Um, it's got uh, Gallagher as one of its parents. And so uh, Gallagher being a bloom variety, a grazer. Uh, not that we were necessarily looking for a grazing wheat, but we talk about names. And <coughs> and so that's where the Ahern name comes from, is because we got the uh, Gallagher Iva, you know. OSU, the arena. Yeah, yeah, that's what I was thinking of. Ahern or Ahern, depending on when you went to Kate State and how you took for it, how we use that name. But, um, so we heard yesterday that Ahern was also an extension specialist. Is that right? I didn't know that. Like a group yep. home control. Sounded like a pretty impressive guy. I mean, it, it, it was like a extension specialist in party coach from traveling all over the state and doing all of that, and a coach later on as well. Yeah. However, well, okay. So we're slackers. Yeah, you are. <laughs> <laughs> you get something to achieve. <laughs> so, um, it's, you know, it tends to be more on the medium, medium, late side. Uh, you know, it tends to be like better varieties for us. Um, it, it's performed uh, relatively well, certainly in the south central part of the state. Uh, I think Romulo, I think it was one of your highest forage yielder ones for your cooking study last fall. Yeah, he put out the 3,500 pounds dry matter per acre. Uh, that compared to probably an average. Last, last fall, we had a lot of forage, but the average was, I think, was close to 3,000, so uh, 28 to 3,000 there. So, yeah, it's pretty good for the best producer right there. Yeah, I mean, we don't we don't do a lot of testing for forage production. You know, in case they variety, it's not a, it's not a major concern for the breeding program, but it's kind of nice when one of them comes along that does, does do that. So, um, what else? Leaf rust, ripe rust, guilty, I think are kind of average on that. Probably a little better on leaf rust, a little light on stripe rust. Yep. Um, exactly. So, you know, I think, I think really everything coming out of you know, any of the breeding programs now, they're going to say you need to manage them as a side. If you're going to grow wheat, uh, and, you know, and be uh, effective with it, you just need to plant a plant side in. Uh, it's just a matter of picking your window. You know, are you going to have to treat early because you need the protection from stripe rust? You need a little later for the frost, and where are you going to give you what you just have? So, I would be pleased with Aher. I, I kind of feel like you know it could fit up in this area, but I haven't really seen it a lot up here yet. Um, but up here, I mean, last year just have one year of data, right? It was uh, it was right there competitive with the average of the variety. So, so we like this around the average, meaning it's competitive with everyone else. Uh, South Central Kansas, it was towards the top, and so I think that. Maybe in terms of air adaptation, you know, as you go south from here, maybe a little bit more. But uh, here's well, less zeros competitive with the other varieties. So. Yeah, sometimes I wonder if it's just a little more energy in the forage and less in the grain. And maybe that's what we see. Mm -hmm. okay, it's hatchet. Um, so, again, another new one from K State. Um, it's going to be kind of on that early maturing side, more like Everest. Um, we particularly like hatchet um, to go in after beans. Um, good tillering in the fall, uh, kind of gets going uh, up there. Um, but then it'll, the other side of it is if you plant it at a more normal time, it's going to mature a little more early side. So if you want to get it off early and call it um, some soybeans, uh, you know, or something like that, you've got 
those options. Uh, Hatchet is named for a uh, decent researcher for immunology, Jim Hatchet, who did a lot of work with Hatchet Fly back in the 80s. And, and, uh, and so it has Hatchet Fly resistance, which is something a lot of the breeding programs have kind of forgot about. Um, you know, it hasn't really been an issue for, I don't know, a long time. Um, and so uh, a lot of the wheat varieties out there don't have fish and fly resistance. Uh, this is one that does, and, and, and even the public states stuff does it. So that's one of the things that kind of sets it apart. Um, it's been, uh, you know, it's for one of the earlier varieties, has been a good yielder, uh, but it is susceptible to stab. Um, has yeah, got some pretty good strikers resistance, but yeah, it, 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 yeah. and maybe we've lost a little bit of that even last year with some of the changes. Um, uh, pretty decent wheat press resistance. So, K State, uh, wheat breeder out of Manhattan, which is where this comes from, um, has really started working on wheat press resistance a long time ago by stacking genes. So, a lot of the things that are coming out of this program now are going to have multiple gene resistance, maybe not major genes. But minor genes for the resistance so that when that leaf rust uh, does change, it doesn't go from you know resistance to susceptible to uh, And that's been a pretty effective package. And so the nice thing for a wheat breeder is now you can think about something else, not fighting the rust cut. He's not been as effective, I think, when it comes to stacking genes against strike rust, but strike rust is looking, it seems to be changing a little more. Um, and so uh, he does have some sap genes in there, but it's just a little bit too many checks. So um, Hatchet is uh, really a pretty decent quality lines. Uh, we haven't uh, got the okay from the grain craft to get along with the food variety list. We want to see it more years, more environments, so I think it's probably really good for it. So uh, if you like something on the earlier side, maybe Hatchet's it. If you happen to know you're going near volunteer or have a oh, high risk yeah. street situation, this would this would not be the right price. So this is like this. Catch it like there was this pretty pretty simple. Uh Zenda. Zenda been around a while uh now. Um probably you guys have seen some of in this area. Um pretty broad area of adaptation. Uh, the thing we like about Zenda uh, is that it's got you know, pretty good two varying uh, resistance for scab. Uh, not quite as good as Everest, uh, but maybe a little lower down levels where we see sometimes. Um, and it's more of a medium maturity or a few days later than Everest. So if you want to avoid that, you know, that early potential freeze um, time, you know, a little better that way. Um, where we had lost the strike rust resistance in Everest, uh, we got it back in Linda, but we kind of lost some of that again. Um, the trust is still holding up pretty well. So, you know, it, it, it's a good variety to go after corn, um, you know, if that's what your situation is. Um, but again, I think we're starting to see Zen to get a little age on it and, and the performance of it is keeping up to some of the other. And, and again, I think I probably like it a little further south than here. And we don't have here on the lineup, but Larry is one that in this region has been doing really well. So it's about the same age as Zenda out there, but probably for a different system, right? Maybe if you're going after beans or something on these lines, Larry would probably be a really good candidate there, really good standability, um, has just a strong good record here as well. So you should have, be able to find a good information on Larry because it's been around for a while, but yield wise, again, last year it was uh, number two in this region. Two years in a row, it was number one there, and three years in a row, it's, it's on that top building category. So, they go to Larry, too. Yeah, I think the challenge with Larry is finding seed. Um, again, with so many coming out, the seed producers, they have to choose. Mm -hmm. And when it kind of took a hit in those first couple of years, it wasn't very popular. Um, even though this, the seed guys have had really good luck with it because they do manage the disease that closes on. So it's just one of those things to do in seed production. Um, I think we were down to uh, just a handful of you know, maybe five or six producers okay. this last year that had it. So it was the one that I got the most phone calls for. Where can I find Larry? Because it did great, but now I can't find anybody that seed. So uh, it's, it's something you're interested in. There's a look around. Was um, there a lot more planted this year then? Was there a lot of guys planting, like the seed guys planting more Larry since so, there was a higher demand for it this year? Or you know, not? so I say with so many varieties coming out, uh, you know, and, Realistically, most of these guys can only handle about 
four or five varieties of the notes that we can just the things you have to go through and seek direction. You have probably like a separate bins and mm -hmm. those sort of things. Um, a lot of them just drop away because they just make every single move together. And, and, and I think to some extent, some of the new ones are better. Larry has pretty good drop tones. I think we're going to see Larry do really well again this year, um, especially because obviously there's no big drops, which is what he's kind of susceptible to. Um, and it has some tolerance to boot strength, which is not great, and it's a very good model. So, yeah, I mean, I know we've got a guy south of Salina that's probably going to be able to the Larry so far. Yeah, but a lot of it's, it's a, they, they sold out last year, and so those guys can go a little more, but we need to see what So double stop CL plus is an Oklahoma State variety there, probably a little bit far from its area of adaptation uh, up here. I think we're a little bit too far north for, for double stop. But uh, within that clear field technology, right, the CL plus for the beyond herbicide, uh, it's probably the most widely used variety kind of in that the central border of Kansas. But again, mostly probably, I would say McPherson and South there has had a pretty decent run. Um, it's a, it has one of the best asset soil tolerance of, around. So it tested before and it seems to hold in very well on you know, those acid soil conditions. It's a fairly tall variety, uh, medium late on maturity there, decent drought tolerance as well. So overall it has had a good run, uh, really good leaf health overall too. And so, uh, but it, with that late maturity in its area of adaptation down south, it tends to get caught in the heat every now and then there because of the late maturity. Uh, but it has had a, had a good run, it's been around for a while now, and so many group growers in south, in, in south central Kansas especially those who are doing dual purpose. Uh, they, they like double stock quite a bit because of that characteristic as well. Uh, this is why double stock here helps you. Yeah, so it's one that's held up well to striped rust and leaf rust, actually a little bit better than, it's actually one that got better over time. Usually that doesn't happen, but I think the breeder went in and actually did some reselection. So they picked the plants that looked the best and then they actually uh, released that as kind of a, a new double stop, but it was the same same double stop, right? So it just had some improved hydronomics and improved uh, leaf health as well. We don't even have your data for it up here this far north, so probably really better <laughs> down south. So folks, we have a couple of varieties here, Rockstar and Paradise, that they are licensed through Polanski up in, in, in uh, Bellevue there in Republic County. Um, out of those, these two, I'll probably keep most of my, my time here on Rockstar. Uh, it has been doing really well. It's been a very solid performing variety. Uh, you know, last year it was uh, rank, ranking number five there, well above average. Two years average in this region, ranked number three. And um, if we go three year average, Rockstar has ranked number one there. So uh, really decent yield record on Rockstar for this region here. And it moves south fairly well as well. Good standability on Rockstar is going to be a medium maturity variety, maybe a couple of days earlier than what we have in uh, SY Monument there. Uh, good on acid soils as well. Uh, so, just overall, uh, it has been a, a good variety. Just like a comment on double stop now, uh, leaf health and leaf hygiene on this one is, is very high as well. Many times you go towards later in the season, you're taking some of our own readings. Uh, it seems like it keeps its green leaf area all the way to the, the bottom of the stem there. And many varieties are already kind of trying to dry it up. So I think that it has kind of an extended green canopy there that probably helps with its uh, yield potential uh, every now and then. This year, we're going to see how it handles drought, right? But the last three years, at least, it has had a really solid performance in this region. Yeah, so Romola mentioned uh, really nice leaf health on Rockstar. So we're seeing it hold up pretty well to defrost and stripe rust, right? So it's one that um, is still holding up to the races we have here. So you know, maybe wouldn't respond as much from that fungicide, or you could really kind of protect the top end yield there if you apply a fly green fungicide on Rockstar. Um, you know, when we're looking at it, kind of comparing down to Paradise, it's very similar in terms of disease package. Um, one thing that kind of went back to what Rockwell was mentioning is it has really good resistance to those those leaf spotting diseases, like hand spot, right? So if you have a weed after leaf rotation, you have those leaf spotting diseases that kind of work their way up the canopy. You know, Rockstar seems to hold it, its um, lower leaf canopy uh, greenness a lot better than some of the other varieties that we've seen. In it. And that seems to translate into some of the yield. Um, it's, it's just intermediate to susceptible for wheat streak. So 
It's not going to be the absolute worst uh, that we've seen here, but it doesn't have any of those kind of important genes that would, would drive some of the weak streak uh, resistance that we do have in some of the other. Yeah, that's curious. Do we know any? Uh, I presume Lansky was licensing these genetics from somebody. Do we know anything about the factory? Some things, where these are coming from? Uh, I haven't been able to get much of that information. Uh, I would suspect it's probably Acropro because he, he has a pretty close relationship with them there. Uh, but I, I I don't know. Do you know there or what where he's coming from? Uh, yeah, I know. I know that's Rockstar and Richard Pass the place to the people from Agripro. Their Agripro has an Amazon selling off their some of the things like that. They, they feel like they can do it themselves. Uh, they can bring them down to the firm. Yeah, you know, I you can't say, well, if they didn't think it was good at the market, but and, and I will be honest, personally, I haven't been all that impressed with Paradise for Rockstar. Because one of the things I've learned, I don't know if the reader works for you, but they say what they see in the way they they evaluate varieties might be a lot different than what happens out in the farm. Uh, and so sometimes they miss things. And I think Rockstar is one of them that got missed because of the way the breeding programs operate and evaluate things versus the way things can actually happen in the farm. And, and so you get a company like Polanski that has an opportunity to plant some of those out in other generations and put them in a different environment. Um, and, and, and it's probably, you know, again, it's a paradise too. Um, it's probably more local, you know, agriculture wants to market over a huge area and it's going to do that. Uh, I, I, it's done a pretty solid variety. Yeah. Well, they're probably thinking maybe we should. Just like you were saying, you're not going. Well, I can see if I'm leaving grain or I'm Santana or I'm Bayer, and I've got this, I cover this yeah. big country, right? Yeah. I can't deal with all these genetics. Do you think there's opportunity for some of these smaller regional seed companies to pick things that maybe have a really good fit, but in a pretty small area, and maybe that's what plants can do? One thing I noticed here in your description is that of all the descriptions, this seems to be the most flattering for milling baking quality on paradise. I don't know if that's true or not, if it's a standout amongst all of these varieties or not, but that's you know. I, well, I did up the description again. Okay, I, I didn't always include what for every variety what you were trying to mix up because it's safe. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. I think one of the things is um, protein will cover a multitude of sins in a variety, so to speak. Uh, if you've got good protein, you know, 12 plus, um, you, even something that's going to complain about Everest as bad as it, it can be from the baking, not milling, but from the standpoint, um, you can even do a lot of, you know, and so when you get into some of these varieties, a lot of times, if they're putting that energy into protein, then we might be putting it into energy. Mm -hmm. So I think that's typically what you see is the ones which are better protein, better quality, or also a little bit more energy on that scale, to unless they manage specifically. Yeah, there, there's a good comment. We, we definitely see that trade off, uh, like uh, high, like 46 and 90. What I mentioned was a bean buster, protein was just like. Almost like a turkey type of, of, of quality. So it's definitely that trade off. You know, just a, one comment that I'm making paradise here. Uh, if you look at the yield record, right, last year, top yielding group, two year average, middle, three year average, bottom. So that's what we're seeing in paradise, just a lot of instability. So the, the, the yield record here really reflects exactly what we're seeing on it there. So, you know, it might win one trial, it's going to be towards the bottom of the other one. I still haven't been able to pinpoint exactly why. I think it has to do with it performing maybe slightly better in, in tougher environments. Wants to give it more potential, more environmental there, uh, nutrition and so on. Probably a little bit more, more lodge and things along these lines. That's kind of what I've been feeling so far. Uh, but again, just that instability that we have on it, I haven't really been a big fan and, and wasn't able to uh, really get a good grip on this variety yet, even though it's been around since 2017 or so. Yeah, very similar to Rockstar, I guess, like I mentioned, Rockstar is a notch better uh, for 
those tan spots, lower canopy leaf health. And I don't know, paradise, you know, unlike Rockstar, I don't know. It's very different when you look at them in the plot. I don't know if it's showing in this plot here, but paradise kind of burns up its lower canopy. It seems like earlier you see those lower lower leaves fade to the brown. It's not necessarily a disease. They just kind of shrivel up. I'm not sure um, what's driving that, but you know, rocks are it's visibly no noticeably different, right? Rocks are when you hold that leaf greenness right towards the end of the season. Um, and, and rock star would be a touch better for scat. So we're getting into some of the syngenta varieties. That's why Wolverine, a fairly new variety here as well. Uh, now, Wolverine, actually fairly new, but I think we have, we have three years of data. So I mean, it's been around for three years now. Uh, you know, uh, Wolverine, I like at this variety, especially as we go kind of towards that Southwest part of the state. It's got a pretty good drought tolerance. It kind of shows a little record out there. Uh, very good standability on Wolverine as well. It's got the uh, wolf in the background, it's got flat, and it's got Everest in the background there. So really good standability, really good drought tolerance as well. It's not going to handle acid soils, so it, it is very susceptible to low soil pH. When we look again at the yield record, in southwest Kansas, it's been pretty solid, kind of towards the top third very consistently. If we look at this region here, north central part of the state, it's been right there about the average. One year, two year, three year, it's been hanging in there about the average. Meaning it's not going towards the bottom, which is good, right? It's not dragging out there, but it's and it is competitive with most varieties, but perhaps it's not showing the potential that it has in this region here. Maybe because of some acid soil concerns or just a little bit too early in the maturity. It's gonna be a medium early uh, maturing variety here. So again, I've liked this one, probably more towards the south, central, southwest part of the state. Uh, and one that we may need to watch out on the seas here, right, Kelsey? Yeah, so that's something we noticed. Last year, we had some bad strike for us uh, across the state, and, and in some of our plots with Wolverine, we noticed uh, it's pretty susceptible to strike for us, probably more susceptible than it was originally um, marketed as by, by some of the biographers out there. So that would just be a watch out for me that that likely fungicide in a, in a strike for us here. One thing that's nice about Wolverine is it does have resistance like wolf to those weak spotting diseases, so to hand spot Victoria. Uh, we have some, some studies that are looking at wheat um, uh, and some of these diseases under different residue levels, and Wolverine is one that holds up well. It does have kind of high residue, high intensity uh, conditions there. AP Ever Rocks, another, uh, it's a newer one uh, out of uh, AgriPro line up there. It's got Everest and it's got Bulls Rock as well on the background there. That's where the name is coming from. It's also got SY Wolf on the background. Uh, one year of data that we have had on this one, uh, as we were doing the plot tours yesterday, South Central Kansas, it was kind of showing towards the bottom. Uh, taking a look at the data here, just so, as of last year, it has had, it's right there about the middle, it's slightly above the average, so just a much above. The average, so maybe this is going to be a little bit better air of the fish for it. Let's wait more, at least one more year, and get more data before we can actually say anything there. But medium early, medium short maturing variety here. It's going to be uh, this one will do fairly well in low soil pH, contrary to, to the Wolverine that we were just talking about. Uh, very good sustainability as well, uh, and good fall forage production on this one. Uh, what about the disease package on that rock, uh, Kelsey? Yeah, from what we've seen, and we just have a, a very small amount of data. Uh, the disease package is, is not perfect, so it's intermediate to on the more susceptible side for strike for us, uh, so probably more susceptible to leaf for us. Mr. Mosaic would be a watch out here as well, so one that would probably need that, that extra management. Although we briefly talked about this one before, uh, I, I agree with Daryl there. Maybe I think it was a better decision for us to license it out there because it's been a pretty solid variety in central Kansas, right? Uh, medium early maturing variety, it's gonna be a tall wheat. So it doesn't have a dwarfing gene. So usually there are three dwarfing genes that control plant height and wheat. It doesn't have any of those. And so uh, it gets pretty tall, but it has a decent straw strength. So it hangs in there fairly well as well. Uh, quality is exceptional in this one. Uh, that lack of that dwarfing gene also gives you a pretty long polyoptile. We're measuring that now in, in many of the varieties out there. And uh, Bobo has had kind of very consistently the longest colloquial in the trial there, uh, because I guess because of the lack of the dwarf gene. It also puts quite a bit of forage because of the lack of dwarf gene. Yield record has been on the top third here, uh, fairly consistent just last year, two years in a row, 
and three years in a row as well. Actually, if you look at the three-year average of, among 10 trials, uh, Buffalo was number three right there. So really this is a new record in this part of the world. And it seems like uh, it holds its new performance all the way to South Central Kansas there. So overall, just a, just a really good variety. I think it has a place in the short lease. Uh, keep in mind, it's going to produce a lot of residue. So uh, you need to either have that, if you like that residue, right, help you with weed control on your next summer crop or things along these lines, is another advantage out there. What about disease package calcium from both here? Yeah, so it's one that has a really nice disease package too. So it's not, it's not quite as good as Zenda for scab, right? But it's one that's more intermediate uh, to scab. So that's an option after, after corn there. And it's holding up really well to leaf and stripe for us. So, you know, that's that's really nice, especially if you maybe don't want to make that fungicide application. Um, I would say one watch out is wheat streak mosaic, so it doesn't have any type of resistance to wheat streak mosaic. It's, you know, in, in one of those fields, we are volunteering, it would be uh, kind of a bad situation. It does get tall. We have in some of our research trials, and last year, I think, uh, up in Belleville, I was trying to wade my way through. So, <laughs> usually I like working on wheat because it's, it's short, but, uh, but surprisingly, you know, it, it, it didn't always lodge in those situations. But we're seeing it now in drought, you know, it's definitely uh, looking actually like normal height wheat, right? So uh, just just a yeah, a watch out there if you get to some. The last one on the plot is SY Monument, another one that needs a touch for you guys, right? It's been around for a while. So monument is, is the case that we were talking before that you know back in 16, 17, 18, it was consistent towards the top of the U whenever we look at these long-term uh, data here. Uh, but now in, in yesterday, south, uh, central and south central, it was kind of that average. Looking at the central and north central here, uh, it's almost kind of falling towards the, the bottom of the dot, right? So uh, I don't know if just the last three years one weren't really a, a monument years for this region here, but it's kind of falling towards that uh, below average category there. You know, there's still some traits there that uh, that are interesting for planting late after beans. It does put out a lot of fevers, and it's, I think it's still a good option in those uh, situations. Uh, good acid soil tolerance, good drought tolerance as well. So really large footprint in terms of uh, within the state of Kansas here. Medium late maturing variety and uh, straw strength is going to be kind of below average there. So probably not one for those uh, high yielding bottom grounds, uh, high fertility, but uh, after beans where you stress it a little bit and give it less chance to grow, I think that it can hang in there pretty well. So again, still could be one to, to be taking a look at in some scenarios there, but they're probably falling down behind the EU as compared to some other ones. Yeah, so Monument's one that, you know, kind of was an indicator for us back in 2018 that we probably had some numerous of strike rust that we that was planted on many acres and had a really good strike rust reaction up until, you know, that 2018 fully in the time frame. Now it's looking a little more susceptible, right? So, that's one of the unfortunate things that, that seems to be happening with strike rust. Uh, we do get some new or exotic races in every so often, and that, that will kind of shake up our, our strike rust reaction. So that's why we do a screening uh, at K-State with the USDA in collaboration. We try to test these varieties to the really common strike rust races we put them pretty hard uh, with several races every year. So, you know, when you look at our K-State data, you know that that's, uh, that's been challenged with with the races that we have that are current here in, in uh, Kansas, right? So I think that that's pretty important to uh, So were there any varieties of that? Or did you have a question? I, I have a management question. So I, whenever it's appropriate. Okay, any, any time. I we're, we're kind of well, and, I, and again, I'm sorry for making any mistakes. I know we got to keep things, but from a management perspective, I'm curious with respect to K-State research. Are, are you doing any research with respect to seeding rates and inspection of seed size? Uh, you know, in our world of precision ag and all of our row crops, of course, we, you know, we're, we're, we're managing to seed count. And, and we're not doing that in our small grains yet. I, I think we're starting to pay more attention. We have some seed count. Craig had noted on Bob Dole, Tend to be a larger seed size, so keep that in mind. I, I'm just curious what kind of research you're doing to, to think about moving us someday to a point where we start to inspect and think about the number of seeds we're planting per acre rather than the number of pounds we're 
plant the brick. You know, and a three dollar wheat, I've joked that, you know, wheat's been our number one cover crop for quite a few years, right? But at eleven dollar wheat, and I don't know how long that'll stick, then things begin to change. And if the crop's more valuable, then we're gonna need to elevate some of these management things. And so just that's a broad question and I'm curious what your thoughts are. Yeah, no, I, I absolutely agree with you. And since I got here back in 2015 was my first year, but that's 15, 16 here in Kansas. I've been kind of trying to push us in that direction, right? So, for example, all of our research is done in seeds per acre. We, uh, we were able to change the variety of trials to be run in seeds per acre as well, because up to that point, it was all, uh, you know, uh, 75 pounds or something yeah. like that. And now, you just look at the weight difference they go into those envelopes might be double, right? Yeah. Just for you to get to the same seed size. So, uh, we're moving in that direction in many fronts. Uh, in terms of research, looking at seed size, uh, you know, I have had the collaboration with Polanski actually for three years there, uh, where we were getting SY monument and we we're doing uh, seed quality. So, either just right out of the combine, we're planting that seed directly, or through an air spring, or through the top, uh, just getting out of the top of, top of the graph, right? Those three uh, seed cleaning intensities were bringing our seed up uh, like quite a bit there, probably from. 28 to 32 to 30 to 32 grams per thousand seeds, right? So we have those different seed size. And that's, uh, we had that trial in interaction with seed rate. So seed size by seed rate by seed treatment. So we're, we, we had, uh, it was an 18 treatment there with uh, uh, three seeding rates, uh, either we or about seed treatment and the three seed size as well, right? Uh, we did that for three years in about 30 locations. So a pretty nice data set that we got out of there showing a Pretty consistent value of seed size in terms of as you're increasing our seed size through cleaning. There, uh, we're getting right, it was about uh, so in the seeding rate, we as we were going up, we're getting a pretty consistent, I think it was five or six push breaker at each bump from 600 to 900, 1.2 million seeds breaker. Uh, then for the seed size, every bump there, we're getting about two bushels breaker from going from that. Uh, no cleaning at all to the air screen to the top. So each step was a couple of bushels per acre there. And on the seed treatment, we were getting about 1.2 or 1.5 bushels per acre from that seed treatment as well. So once you put the costs into that, you know, it, it's pretty clear that we should be cleaning the seed if possible all the way to the top of the gravity. And whenever I put the numbers there, that we was still 450 a bushel there, uh, we, you were breaking even on that seed treatment cost. Now at least 13, 11, 12, 13, there's definitely uh, some room to make money through C3 there as well. So, a three year pro project, we finalized that last year. So, a total of 30 locations. So, pretty solid data on that. Uh, of course, there is a curve, right? A bell curve where the average gain from the C3 was 1.5, but it went from anywhere from negative sometimes all the way to close to 10 bushels per acre in some cases as well. For the process of understanding, okay, when do we have those high ones, when can we see perhaps some yield loss, that we yield loss consistent enough for us to be concerned sometimes. So we definitely have quite a bit of things going on there around. Uh, we had a project there as well for uh, for two or three years there, where we're doing like a variety by seed rate interaction. Uh, so we're having five to seven varieties, and then we're having uh, very low seed rates all the way to two million, so from 600,000 all the way to two million seeds per acre, just trying to pick up some, some of that interaction. We have a project that we started this year that we're looking at delivering potential of those, of those varieties under reduced seeding rates, right? So we're really um, going, so we have them in two scenarios in each trial, right? Either uh, 1.2 million seeds per acre, where we want it to be, and as low as about 400,000 seeds per acre. So just pushing very low population to see how many dealers they can produce. Mm -hmm. And we're putting that trial in as high fertility as a yield contest winning field, but early in the fallow period uh, with uh, very high fertility to really, really allow for dealer, all the way to late planted after bees and fallow field, which doesn't give the crop yield time to dealer at all. Right? So we're, we're doing a lot of things in that round. In the, in the management side, I try to have a very active program there. Uh, I know that historically we've done a lot of with varieties. Uh, I'm, my program, I'm focusing on the interaction of variety and management. So that's, that's great. I'm glad to hear that. I, I think those are all really important things. 
that can help us. We just haven't had a lot of motivation lately. But now if we have some motivation in the market pricing, yeah. that can help us begin to move to new levels of, of accomplishment. Absolutely. And as part of this, we have a new program it's called We Are X. Maybe some of you guys attended those programs before or not. We, we, we have just started this year. That's a series of meetings and publications that we what we want to do there is take wheat production to the next level, treat it as a crop, what do we need to do there uh, to really bring our goods up and profits as well. Uh, actually, we're talking about doing a with our ex school replant meeting. Uh, we're going to have a couple of them. One is going to be in Garden City. And I need to check the wheat commission is the one organizing that. Uh, but if it's not, so you guys are going to have a protein plant here, right? And I think there's another one in this perfect, I believe. So which one is the one that's going to be inaugurating in, in in August this year, is it Russell? We have a loop. Yeah, we have is that yeah. what you're the gluten. Yeah, that's yeah. already off. It's operating. Right so operation. That must be Phil's burger. So Phil's brew there, they're, they're inaugurating that in August. So we're going to have a pre planned meeting there focusing on management of the crop like that. Uh, of course, we we'll focus on protein, uh, but the whole with our X program is for us to, to not only produce more yield, but more quality. Thank you. Yep. Uh, I said, I said, good information. This this was recorded, so hopefully, if you want to watch it again, and hopefully, you know, other people will be able to see it. You could. I passed out some survey cards to fill out, just some general feedback. So definitely thankful for Rami and Kelsey for coming and taking time out of their busy schedules to. To do this, I know I said Mother Nature wasn't cooperating on going to the plots, but 